one of the things we found out that we probably should have known was that the price fluctuations in a given country frequently exceeds the price fluctuations in the world market. What governments in most countries are trying to do is to stabilize food prices because food prices are so important politically in countries where food occupies a very large share of the expenditure of the consumer. So it isn't unusual for a low-income consumer in a developing country to spend more than half of its money on food, whether that's food they produce themselves or food that they buy. So when food prices fluctuate, their real purchasing power fluctuates. And governments don't like fluctuating purchasing power in the population because that creates instability. And if it really gets bad, riots, smashing windows, and burning cars. So governments are very concerned about maintaining stable food prices. When food prices fluctuate in the international market, therefore, they try to protect the domestic market. They either remove import tariffs, if it's an importing country, which would uh, lower the food prices uh, domestically, or they put an export restriction, maybe an export ban on food, if it's an exporting country. In the case of the former, uh, many of the African countries removed import taxes, which brought down the, the price uh, of imported food when, in fact, the world market price went up. In the case of the latter, where they, um, re they put restrictions on exports, India and China managed to maintain their domestic prices almost unchanged during a period of time when the international prices, and I'm talking about prices of cereals, of grains, when the international prices went up dramatically, they didn't really change in the domestic market of India and China. Why? Because those two countries manipulated their trade policy in such a way that there was virtually no transmission of price fluctuations in the international market into those domestic markets. You also have cases where the country simply kept an open market. Brazil and South Africa, for some of the grains, uh, said, look, we will just let the prices transmit into domestic markets. If the price goes up in the world market, so be it. It will go up in our domestic market. What they then did to protect those groups that would otherwise cause violence and riots in the street, they would compensate them either by <clears throat> targeted food subsidies, reducing the food prices, uh, using fiscal, using money uh, from government, or they would uh, transfer cash so they could afford to buy, buy the food. So it, the countries behaved very differently. And, and what was interesting in this study was to, to understand why they behaved differently. And that goes right back to the question of of the various interest groups. And how much power does each of those interest groups have? And what is the agenda of each of the interest groups? And in uh, South Africa and Brazil, uh, large farmers had a major say in the matter. So when food prices went up internationally, those large farmer associations say, wait a minute, just let the prices go up. That would be fine for us. Whereas in other countries, consumers had more power than the, than the farmers. And the, and the consumers would say, look, if you don't control that price increase, we're going to come after you. And we're going, to, we're going to threaten your legitimacy. You may not stay in power for very long after we finish with you unless you control those prices. So what the government did, among other things, was they had targeted income transfers when the food prices went up, 
They targeted income transfers or food subsidies to the groups that they were most scared of. Those were not the groups that were the most seriously affected. You would think from a more ethical perspective, they would compensate the poorest of the poor who may spend as much as 70% of their income on food, compensate them for, uh, to, to protect them from the negative impact of food price increases. They didn't. They were targeting the transfers on the lower middle class in urban areas because that was the group that would instigate trouble for the government. That was the group that either went on the, to the streets themselves or paid somebody to go on the street and demonstrate or do things that were worse. Governments were very concerned about that. Whether they were dem um, democratically elected or they were self-appointed, those governments had priority number one, protect our legitimacy. That wasn't what they said. They said, our priority number one is to protect food security, meaning that everybody has access to enough food, and if that is threatened, we will compensate the people who can no longer afford to buy the food they need. That's what they said. It's not what they did. Absolutely. We have seen a, an urban bias in food policy uh, for a very long time. It was a lot worse 40 years ago than it was 20 years ago, but since the world food crisis beginning in 2007, the urban bias has been more pronounced, meaning that governments are much more concerned about making the urban population happy than making the rural population happy. Now, there are exceptions to that. China is an exception. China is very concerned about stability in rural areas. And they will um, introduce, they have introduced policies for the benefit of the rural poor. But in most countries, there is a bias towards benefiting the urban poor. And that means, for example, food subsidies, um, access to food at lower prices than what the market would offer. So we, we saw an increase in that bias towards, towards urban areas, um, precisely for the reason that, or at least partly for the reason that uh, the rural poor are less likely to get organized and threaten the government. Each unit in government, being a ministry or uh, some other unit, would have its own agenda, it would have its own goals, and it will try to pursue those goals by, by whatever means are available to the, to the ministry. Now, some governments have a very strong leader who is actually capable of, of keeping these various uh, goals and uh, approaches together. In other governments, that's not, that's not so. Ministry of Agriculture would have one, uh, one uh, goal and uh, would try to achieve that goal, whereas uh, other ministries, the Ministry of Health, for example, would have uh, a, different, a different goal and were trying to pursue it different ways. What happened, in, to the extent that we could get the information, in these debates with, within the government itself, you frequently had some very heated arguments as to what the policy intervention should be. And, it, and what we may see from the outside is a government that makes a decision. It looks like a unitary government making a decision. Everything is beautiful. Well, what, what happens in reality is there's a lot of um, fighting or arguments going on before you arrive at that. In governments that didn't really were cohesive, you could end up with policies that were contradictory. So one ministry would... would be capable of putting in place of implementing one policy and another ministry would implement another one. So you saw some of, some of that as well. Most governments respond um, to a, within a very short time horizon. And 
it is possible that a government will think to the extent that governments think, but the, pol the policy makers will expect that they can survive until the uh, next election or the next appointment without having another price spike. So therefore, there's no need for making the investments. But we have to be very clear about the difference between investing in a sustainable improvement such as investing in rural infrastructure, in roads, in institutions, in irrigation facilities, in energy, electricity, and telephones, and all of that. That's investing in a sustainable future, whereas a subsidy uh, or some panic solution of the kind of the, that took place is not an investment. It's money spent, and it, it really has no long-term positive effect. So. The, the enlightened government will use this current window of opportunity where we don't have uh, huge price increases to prepare for the next one. But it does take a somewhat longer time horizon than most governments have. But it's no different from investing in education. You invest in kids' education, it's not going to have a payoff for many years to come. You invest in agricultural research, it takes a while for that to, to, to work. That is why governments, in most cases, would much rather give a fertilizer subsidy, because that has an effect next year, than making investments in ag research, which may have an, an effect 20 years from now. But those very short-term solutions are extremely expensive and they're not sustainable. The evidence base for understanding how the policy process works is rather deficient. But the evidence base that the policymakers need to make the right policy decisions is extremely weak. We really need to help governments, whether it's in a developing country or a high-income country, governments need help in setting up institutions that will generate the context-specific knowledge that policymakers need. Now, there are people who argue that policymakers are irrational and they do not respond to evidence. They are wrong, those who argue that. Policymakers respond to evidence, but they may not respond in the way that we think they should or that we think is rational, but they have their goals and they pursue those goals using the best evidence available. That is why in, uh, organizations such as WIDA is very important in generating the, or helping to generate the capacity that's necessary to develop that uh, context-specific knowledge. Without that knowledge, policymakers um, will still make decisions they have to, but then they may not uh, make the right ones as far as they themselves are concerned. Certainly the best we can do as researchers is to help governments understand the consequences of alternative action. Make that available to all of the stakeholder groups and say, okay, if the outcome of the policy process is this policy intervention, here are the likely consequences for all of the groups that the government or the, the society is interested in. If, however, you choose this other route, this other policy intervention, you have a different set of outcomes. That, I think, is what WIDA should be doing. That is what the International Food Policy Research Institute has been doing uh, over many years. Uh, that's what I think some of the university uh, economists should be doing, policy analysts. We shouldn't tell governments what to do. We should tell governments, here's what happens if you do this versus doing something else.